All right, in 8.2, the first thing that we're gonna talk about is what's happening at either end of the graph of a function called the end behavior, okay? <clears throat> what's gonna determine the end behavior of your graph is the leading term, which is the term that has the highest exponent, okay? If the exponent is even and that term is positive, that means both of the ends of the, of the graph are gonna be going up, okay? Think about like a, a one that we're most familiar with is the x squared graph, right? So what does an x squared have if it's, and has an even exponent? If it's positive, don't the ends of it go like this? What happens when the exponent is even like an x squared, but the term is negative? What does that negative do? It, it flips it upside down, right? That makes the end behavior both go down. That's going for any even exponent. So another way to think about it is if your leading term's exponent is even, the ends of the graph are gonna be doing the same thing. They're either both gonna be up or both gonna be down, depending on whether the term is positive or negative. Okay, so if your exponent is an odd number, that means the ends of your graph are gonna be doing the opposite of each other, okay? One that we are familiar with or more familiar with than others is the graph of x to the third, which goes like that, right? If the exponent is odd and the term is positive, it's going to start down here and travel up throughout the graph. What happens if your x to the third graph had a negative in front of it? It flipped it upside down, which means it starts at the top and travels down throughout the graph. Okay. So we're gonna use this chart, this in behavior chart to do, it looks like the first four problems. Okay, number one, f of x equals the square root of 11 x to the third plus 2x squared minus 4x plus 5. Okay, and then these are going to be multiple choice. They're going to have all four different examples, either both up, both down, starting at the bottom, traveling up, or starting at the top and traveling down. Okay, again, the, what you're looking for is what's called the leading term. The leading term doesn't necessarily always mean the term in the front. It means the term that has the highest exponent. Okay, so what you're going to do is find the term that has the highest exponent, which is this first term. That's what's going to give your graph its end behavior. Okay, so what is going on here? The exponent is odd. And it doesn't really matter anything about this. It's just the sign of the term is what's giving it its end behavior, whether it's positive or negative. So this one is positive. Which means, what about the end behavior? That means the, it's gonna start at the bottom and travel up throughout the graph. Can I do the, uh, the second part? Um, 
whether this term is positive or if it's negative. Right. Yes, that's it. Okay, number two. P of X equals negative pi X to the sixth. Plus X to the fifth minus X to the fourth. Minus X plus five. So again, looking for the leading term. The term with the highest exponent. And again, it is the one in the front this time. So here's what I'm using. That's what's going to give it its end behavior. Its exponent is an even number. And the sign of it this time is negative. So even exponent means my ends are doing the same thing as each other. And negative means what? They're both going to be going down, right? That negative is what's flipping the graph upside down. All right, number three, same thing. F of x equals negative 3.1x to the fourth plus x to the sixth plus 0.1x to the seventh. So again, the leading term doesn't mean the front term. I mean, most of a lot of times it is in the front, but the leading term is always the one that has the highest exponent. In other words, it should be in the front. So this is the term that has the highest exponent this time. So again, you're just going with the exponent and the sign. So this one is an odd number and positive. <clears throat> odd tells me my ends are doing the opposite of each other, one up, one down. And positive means it starts low and travels high. All right, last one like this, number four. Right, two plus one half x to the fourth minus one seventh x to the third. Again, searching out the term with the highest exponent, which is the middle one this time. And this one's exponent is even, which means the ends of the graph are going to match each other. They're going to be doing the same thing. And the term is positive, which tells me both ends will be going up. Okay, number five.
All right, the rest of these problems are gonna just be talking about different things about the zeros of the graph, which are the x-intercepts. <clears throat> On number five, it says, use substitution to determine whether three, the number three is a zero of the following. X to the third minus eight X squared plus 13 X plus six. And it wants to know, is three a zero? Or in other words, if I graph this, would it cross the x-axis at positive three? Okay, one way, you can graph it, but sometimes it's hard to eyeball, right? If it's, whether it's 2.8 something or if it's crossing at three, okay? The for sure, the most definite way is to put three into the x's and see if it's equal to zero. So in other words, you're saying, does is zero occur when I have three to the third minus eight times three squared plus 13 times three plus six. If I plug in threes for the X's and do that math, will it give me zero? <clears throat> you can do it all at once in one step in your calculator. If you just plug in exactly on your home screen, exactly what this says. Parentheses and everything. So open parentheses, three, close. Now remember how to get to the third power. You push this little up arrow that's below your clear button. So that puts you up in the exponent. So you'll go up in the exponent and hit the three. But then after that, once you hit that three, you'll notice you're still in the exponent, right? So to get back down out of the exponent, just hit your right arrow. So three to the third minus eight times three squared. You can either use that same method or squared, remember, has its own button. And the nice thing about it is once you square and hit the squared, it automatically goes back down. Plus 13 times three. plus six and hit enter. And if it gives you a zero, like this one does, right? When I plugged all that in, it did give me zero, which means yes, three is a zero of that function or in other words, <clears throat> it crosses the X axis at three. Okay, before we get into number six, actually let's do seven and eight first and then six, that makes more sense. Okay, on this one, it says to find the zeros of this function and state the multiplicity of each, okay? What your zeros are gonna come from is once everything is in its factored form, okay? And a good way to tell whether something's in its factored form is if you don't have any exponents inside your parentheses. That means that's in its most complete factored form. I don't need to factor it anymore. Okay, once they do have your polynomial in its factored form, right? The unfactored form would be very complicated in this one, but you would have to FOIL this, multiply that times this, and then distribute X to the sixth. That would give me the long version of this function, okay? You want it to be in its factored form like this if you're gonna find zeros, because the way that you find them is you go to each factor that has an X, and set it equal to zero and solve it, okay? So the factors are the things that are multiplied together. So this and these outside exponents are gonna be doing, dealing with the multiplicity and we'll talk about that when we get to it. So first of all, just to find the zero, set each factor that has an X equal to zero,
Right, right. No, you're gonna these these numbers right here are telling me something different about the graph. And this one has a one. I just don't see it because it's in the first power. Those are going to be telling me about what the multiplicity is, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute. So once you set each of the factors equal to zero, solve them for those x's, which means on this one, it's already solved. Right? X is already by itself. This one, I need to get rid of the minus one with a plus one. And this one, I need to get rid of the plus seven with the minus seven. So those are your three zeros or your three X intercepts, zero, one, and negative seven. Okay. What the multiplicity is, is whatever the exponent of that factor was. So what was the exponent of this one? Six. So that means its multiplicity is six. The factor that gave us this zero was two. Good. So its multiplicity was two. And the factor that gave us the negative seven x intercept of zero was one. So its multiplicity is one. And this will come into play on the last problems. But what the multiplicity tells you, okay? Remember what zeros are. They're x intercepts. There's actually two ways to be an x intercept, okay? You can either be an x intercept that crosses the x axis, like that would be an x intercept, or you could be an x intercept as long as you are touching the x axis, you are an x intercept, okay? So you are either an x intercept that crosses the x axis like this or you touch the x-axis and go the other way. That's what the multiplicity tells you about those x-intercepts. If the, <clears throat> if the multiplicity is an odd number, like this one was, that means at this x-intercept, it's going to cross through the x-axis. If the multiplicity is even, like it is on these two, that would mean it's this kind of x-intercept. It just touches the x-axis at this number and goes the other way. But it doesn't cross all the way through it. It's still an x-intercept though because <clears throat> it touches the x-axis, okay? Now, just to finalize this problem, okay, it kind of asked me in a weird way how to enter these answers. The first part says the smallest zero is blank. So which one of these is the smallest? Negative seven. And what was its multiplicity? One. The middle zero would be this zero, right? Because that's in the middle of negative seven, one, and zero. Zero will be the middle one, and its multiplicity is six. And the largest zero is this one, and its multiplicity was two. All right, number eight is like this one also. All right, number eight, f of x equals negative six. Open parenthesis, x minus three to the fourth. x plus one to the third. x squared. So again, your zeros or your x-intercepts come from any factors that have an x. We're not worried about that. Okay, those are the multiplicities, right? 
So each factor that has an X, which means I don't do anything with this, right? It doesn't have an X. So, so if I set this equal to zero and tried to solve it for X, I would be stuck, right? There is no X. So that's why it doesn't make an X-intercept. But this one does. So X minus three. Set it equal to zero. X plus one. Set it equal to zero. And this one's just X. Set it equal to zero. And then solve them for their x's. So this one, I would get rid of that minus 3 with a plus 3. So x equals 3. This one, I would get rid of that plus 1 with a minus 1. So x equals negative 1. And then this one's already solved because the x is already by itself. And then the multiplicities. This one's multiplicity is four. This one's multiplicity was three. And this one's multiplicity was two. Okay, again, it asks it in a weird way. It says the zero three has multiplicity. So here's my zero that's three. So it's multiplicity was four then blank is a zero of multiplicity three. So here's the one that has multiplicity three. It's zero was negative one. And then the other zero, we've already done this one, this one, the remaining zero is zero and it's multiplicity is two. Okay, these weren't as bad because the polynomial was already in its completely factored form. And that's where the zeros come from, are the factors. But going back to number six, actually, before we do six, let's recall a certain type of factoring. Bald. Difference of perfect squares. Okay, if you're factoring a polynomial, and a polynomial is just a fancy word to say a group of terms. So if you're factoring a group of terms, and there's two terms, and they're both what you call perfect squares. What does a perfect square mean? It means it has factors that are the same thing, okay? Like what do you multiply that's the same to get x squared? x and x, right? What do you multiply that's the same number that you multiply together to get 25? Five. That's why they're perfect squares. Not everybody's a perfect square, right? Like 30, there's not a number times itself that gives you 30. So 30 is not a perfect square. But 36 is, right? Because you can do six times six. That's what makes you a perfect square. So when you have different squares, here's how you would end up factoring that. You would have two factors. Whatever you multiply together to get this first term goes at the beginning of each factor, which means x and x. Whatever you multiply to get the last term that was the same number, which was five, goes at the end of each of the factors. And your signs are always one of each, one positive and one negative. If I foiled this out, Right? Because factoring and then foiling back, foiling it back out, or just going back and forth with each, with each other. Right? I would have x times x would give me x squared. What's your outer? Negative 5x, and your inner is positive 5x. So what would happen to those two terms? They would cancel each other out. So what would be your last? Positive 5 times negative 5 is negative 25. So that's why this difference of squares works like that, okay? So let's look at one more before we do that problem. X squared minus one, 
Okay, this is perfect squares, right? We already talked about x squared being a perfect square. Okay, but a lot of times people forget that so is one. Right? One is a perfect square because you can use what to get it? One times one. So it is a perfect square. So this is a difference of squares. X and X. For X squared, one and one to get one. One positive and one negative. And it doesn't even matter where the positive and negative go. You just have to have one of each. All right, so now let's look at number six. Find the zeros of the function and state the multiplicity. So my function is f of x equals x squared minus four. The second power. Now remember on seven and eight, all my factors were already done for me, which means I didn't have any exponents on the inside of my parentheses. This one's not all the way done for me because I have this exponent on the inside of this parentheses, which means I need to factor that some more. Okay, so this is why we did the five the difference of squares review, because that's what this is, right? Those are different to perfect squares in here. So if I factor this, right? This number, what's the outside exponent tell you? That's just, that's your multiplicity. Not affecting what's, got, when you're talking about this, it's not affecting what's going on inside. So they still both, if everything in here is squared, then the factors are the same, nothing changes there. But I just need to factor what's inside here. What gives me the x squared that needs to come here? x times x. Right, the twos will come here. What are your signs always? You don't even have to think about it. It's just, right. So here's my two factors completely factored out. Now I don't have any inside exponents. I can set them both equal to zero. Solve them for their x's. So this one, I'd have to subtract the two from both sides to get x equals negative two. And this one, I'd have to add the two to get x equals positive two. So my zeros are positive and negative two. And what was the multiplicity of each of them? Two. All right, number 10. F of x equals x to the third minus 4x squared minus x plus 4. And it wants us to do the same thing, find the zeros and their multiplicity. Unfortunately, this one is not factored at all, right? I don't see any factors. I see the polynomial all the way multiplied out. So the first thing you have to do is factor this polynomial, okay? And I'm hoping that this is what is in the support part is factoring the four, if you have four terms, and you need to factor those. And there's not anything in common with all four of them, which means you can't pull out what was in common with all of them, right? They don't all have X's. They don't all have the number, the same number that goes into them that you can pull out. What you're gonna do is group them. It's called factoring by grouping. You're gonna put the first two in a group and the second two in a group. And then you're just going to look at each of the smaller groups and pull out what's in common. 
So just looking at this first group, what do these two terms have in common? X, you can actually pull out X squared. You wanna pull out as much as you can. So you can go through, if you if both terms have X in, you're really just looking for the one that has the smallest exponent. That means I can take X squared out of this one and this one. So let's look at what that looks like. If I took the X squared out, of those two terms. So the way I find out what's left is I say, okay, and I like to write it here so I don't confuse myself. Okay, so if I took the X squared out of this first term, what's left? An X minus, if I took the X squared out of this lot of the second term, what's left? That four. So you're done with the first part. You're going to do the same exact thing to the next group, but here's the kicker. What's left in your second parentheses has to be exactly what's left in your first parentheses. So first thing that I notice is I look in here and I'm like, oh, they don't have anything in common. <clears throat> if they don't have anything in common that just is visible, like in the first one, you're either going to pull out a positive one or a negative one. Okay. Oh, then you're just going to have one. Yeah, okay. one, the number one. <clears throat> yeah, so on this one, again, I'm either pulling out positive one or negative one, and that totally depends on, remember, this has to match this. So do I need to change signs or not? That's what tells you whether to pull out positive one or negative one, depending on if these signs need to change in order to match these. And they do, don't they? I need this X to be positive and I need this four to be negative. So that's what's saying, okay, I need to pull out a negative one because that's what changes signs. Right? If you divide by negative one, aren't your signs going to change? So this will turn into just a positive X. That'll turn into negative four. Here's why these two things have to be the same. Because that's the next step. Since these are the same, now I can pull out the X minus four and put in parentheses what's left. So they have an X minus four, both separated by this, they both have an X minus four. So if I take out the X minus four from each of those, it's essentially just gonna cancel them. What's gonna be left in this parentheses? What's left that you see? X squared minus one. I'm almost there. You see how I'm getting factors now? Instead of long polynomial, I've got one more step though. This one's done. I don't have an inside exponent. So this factor's done. But look at this. But look, there's two terms and they're both perfect squares. So that's how I'm going to factor this one to end it. So I just bring down the x minus four. It's done. X and x gives me the x squared. One and one gives me the one plus and minus. Now you're done factoring, right? If I multiply, if I foil this and then multiply what I had left to the X minus one, it would give me this long drawn out polynomial. So I just broke it down into its factors. What do you do with the factors to get the zeros? That's right. Set them equal to zero and solve them for X. So add fours here. So the first zero is four. Subtract ones here. This next zero is negative one and add the one here. So that zero is positive one. So the zeros are four, 
negative one and positive one. And what are the multiplicities of each of these zeros? Will you just go back and look at the factor that they came from? So all their multiplicities are ones, okay? If you wanted to, because remember, what are zeros? They're x-intercepts. If you go to your y equals, put this in and graph it, this would actually come out nice because your zeros are whole numbers. So this would be a good example to do that. If you put in x to the third, then your y equals minus 4x squared minus x plus 4. and graph it, you'll see, what does it do? There's my negative one cross, positive one cross, positive four cross, right? So it works out good to do it by graphing if your x-intercepts are at whole numbers, which isn't always the case. Like let's look at number 10. Number 10 is exactly like this. So the, when I did my factors, weren't they, they all had ones, right? Because once I got down, I just had x, what I have, x minus 4, x plus 1, x minus 1. None of them had exponents that I could see on those factors, which means they were all ones. <laughs> Number 10 should be the same kind of problem, 2x to the third. Minus x squared minus 50x plus 25. So again, if I graph this one, I'm going to notice that one's not one of them is not crossing at a whole number. So I'm going to do the grouping method on this one again. So I'm going to group the first two, group the second two. Again, what comes out of the first group? What can you pull out of both of these? X squared. Good. So here, if I pull X squared out of this first term, I still have the two, and I've still got an X. Minus, I took out the x squared, but you're not just left with nothing, right? What is something over itself? What are you left with if you have, yeah. right, one? Now, remember, again, your second leftover has to match your first, okay? First of all, I see that I actually do have numbers. That, what's the biggest number that goes into 25 and 50? 25 will, twice and once. So now I just have to decide whether or not I need to pull out a positive 25 or a negative 25. So just think about this. If I'm just about, if I just pull out the 25, what's going to be left here? If I divide this by 25, will not have negative 2x. What do I need it to be? Positive. That tells me I got to change the sign. Now let's see here, negative over negative, that's what turns it to positive. 50 over 25 is 2x. Positive 25 over negative 25 is negative 1, so they do match. So remember what the next step was. These match, so I'm going to pull them out. Pull out the 2x minus 1. And put in parentheses what's left. If I take the 2x minus 1 out of each of these, what's going to be left in my second parentheses? 
x squared minus 25. <clears throat> and just like the last one, this factor didn't have an inside exponent, so it was done. But this one was a difference of squares. Right? Because you have x squared and 25, which are both perfect squares. So x and x for x squared, 5 and 5. For 25, 1 plus, 1 minus. So you're all the way done factored out now, right? All your factors don't have any exponents on the inside. So that means I'll set them each equal to zero. And solve them for x. So this one, I have to add the one to both sides. So 2x equals one. And then divide by two. So x equals one half. That's why that one would be hard to see by the eyeball, right? <clears throat> to see where it crossed on the x-axis. These would have been all right. So here you would have had to get rid of the plus five with a minus five. So that zero is negative five. And here, get rid of that plus five. I mean, excuse me, get rid of the minus five with the plus five. So x equals positive five. So the zeros are one half, negative five, and positive five. And what were the multiplicities of each? Remember where you find those. You just go back to the factor that gave you that zero. So here's my factors. So since I don't see any of their exponents, they were all ones. So our multiplicity were all ones. All right, for the last two, it's talking about the multiplicity rules that we talked about earlier. Remember how the multiplicity tells you whether on your x axis, if you're crossing it or just touching it and going the other way. So remember, if your multiplicity, which is your exponent, is odd, you're an x-intercept that crosses the x-axis. If you have even multiplicity, you are what's called tangent to the x-axis. And tangent just means you touch the x axis and go the other way. So you just touch it. You don't cross it, you just touch it. All right. Number 11. Tangent. Tangent to the x-axis, which just means it touches it. All right. So this is saying if P of X equals X minus five to the fourth, and x plus two to the third, then it, so this is a true false, then it crosses the x-axis at five, zero. So it's saying the x-intercept is at five, which it is, there is an x-intercept at five, because remember, where do the zeros of the x-intercepts come from? The fact that you set equal to zero and solve for X. So which one of the factors would this zero have come from? The X minus five or the X plus two? X plus two. 
the x minus five, right? Because if you set x minus five equal to zero and solve it for x, you'd have to add the five to both sides to get the five. So it's saying this at this x-intercept, it's going to cross the x-axis, which means I need to look at the multiplicity of this x-intercept. So its multiplicity is what? Four. Its multiplicity is even, which means what about its x-intercept? It is tangent, right? Not crosses, tangent. So that one would be false because it doesn't cross the x-axis at five. Its multiplicity is even, which means it's tangent to the x-axis at five. All right, last one. Same kind of problem. P of x equals x minus eight to the seventh, x plus five to the tenth. This says it's tangent to the x-axis at negative five. Or I guess I talked about negative five here. So let's see if this one is true or false. If negative five is the x-intercept, which one of these factors did it come from? Right, the x plus five is where it came from. What is the multiplicity of this factor? 10, so the multiplicity is even. And what does even multiplicity tell you? So it is tangent. Right, because all even multiplicities are tangent. So this one was true because the multiplicity of this factor was even. So it was tangent. 